don't have any reverb on. I don't have my headphones. Thank you, Titus. <laughs> Good evening, uh, everybody. Could you turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, last chapter of the book of Daniel. And uh, we're going to, uh, as we normally do before we begin a new chapter, we uh, verse by verse we go and uh, we do an overview, a general outline, go over a general outline of the chapter, what's, uh, what's, what's in this chapter, and a little bit of an outline of it. And then uh, go through it in broad strokes, and then we, starting when we get back uh, on uh, Tuesday, August 19th, we'll resume our studies of the book of Daniel. And uh, as just one more, just for the people on the website, or where it hits our website, and uh, just a reminder that we're, uh, tonight's our last class, we have a, we take our summer break, we'll be uh, no classes this Sunday, August 3rd, and also the weekday classes will be canceled, and then Sunday, August 10th, we don't have class, and the weekday classes following that, uh, the 13th, 14th, the 15th, they cancel, and then we resume classes Sunday, August 17th. So uh, tonight is our last class before the summer break, so uh, keep us all in prayer as we uh, take our traveling, we're, we're Washington and Massachusetts, they give us, uh, God gives us traveling mercies. And um, we're going to uh, also have our prayer meeting at the end of class as well as we normally do on Thursday evenings. We have a prayer meeting on, as you know, on uh, Sunday morning as well for our Sunday people. So uh, you should be at Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. And also, uh, do I, Chaya, did I uh, give you, um, do we have all the cha- 13 verses of Daniel chapter 12? We, you have that in the Daniel translation? Can you check and see what you got there? You should. I gave it to you. I'm pretty sure. It only goes to four. Really? It only goes to four. I knew I should have printed. That's all right. We're not going to. We won't. Uh, we'll read. From, uh, that's no big deal. Uh, just got to remember I got to print that out. But um, all right. Uh, we should. Uh, I thought I, I really thought I gave it to you. I must have gave you the Titus one. All right. That doesn't really matter. Okay. We're going to uh, take a moment of silent prayer. And we do this to examine ourselves to determine if we need to confess any sins to the Father. I do this because um, I know obviously, obviously, you know, before most of us are already in fellowship and before we begin, but there's some people who might visit our website or might pop into Pal Talk by chance, and uh, this is an opportunity for them uh, to, uh, they might not be aware of this, so we do this to give people an opportunity to ensure the fact that they're in fellowship with God, and then when you're in fellowship with God, then you can understand and make application what the, and follow the application that the Holy Spirit is guiding us to. Uh, without being in fellowship with God, you can't understand uh, this spiritual phenomenon in the Word of God. You won't be able to know what God's will is being communicated to you if you're out of fellowship with God because we need to be in fellowship with God to understand the will of God for our lives, understand the Word of God, which reveals the will of God for our lives. So uh, with that in mind, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us so graciously. Another day here on planet Earth. Uh, Help us never to uh, take this for granted uh, that you've given us another day, that we should be thankful for each and every day that you've given to us. We thank you for the bodies and the souls you've given to us, the volition you gave to us. We thank you for the circumstances that you've placed us in. We thank you, Father, for the people that you uh, led into our lives, and godly people in particular, and the adversities and the prosperity in life. And uh, we thank you, Father, for the good times, the bad times. We thank you, Father, for this ministry. We thank you for the people who are a part of this ministry uh, here in Iowa and also those who are supporting this ministry uh, with um, not only their finances but also prayers and serving that are on Pal Talk, our, the, the faithful people there. We thank you for the people who are following us faithfully uh, through the website. We thank you, Father, for all these individuals. We thank you, Father, for the, the studies that we have in Daniel and Titus. And we pray these studies will be a blessing to your people and bring glory and honor to you and your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for Titus and Jody Thompson's uh, 
hospitality, and we just thank you, Father, for uh, them, and also Titus's work with the sound and the recordings. We pray that you give him wisdom in that area, and uh, we just uh, thank you for the technology that you've given to us. We also uh, thank you for everyone that is uh, listening in or in the Thompson home. We thank you for all of them. We pray that you would help them uh, to understand what is being taught in your word. In Daniel chapter 12 this evening, uh, we pray that they would be sensitive to the Spirit's guidance and direction and that the Spirit would speak to each one of them as individuals and the church as a whole. Uh, we just pray that you would give grace to myself as the communicator. Help me to be also sensitive to the Spirit's guidance and direction and to communicate accurately your word to your people so that they are built up and edified spiritually. And of course, we want to, as a result, draw closer to you and your Son and the Holy Spirit in a more intimate fellowship and be more thankful each and every day for our relationship with you. We thank you for the fact that you're in control of history and that you rule history through your Son, Jesus Christ, who now sits at your right hand. And we just uh, look forward to the day when your kingdom is established on the earth through your Son, Jesus Christ, millennial reign and at his second advent in which he'll establish that kingdom. We just thank you for the fact that we are a part of that kingdom. <coughs> And help us to remind us, uh, remind ourselves, to be, help us to uh, remember always that we're part of this kingdom. It's the greatest thing that's ever happened to us. And so, Father, we thank you, praise you for this, for all the blessings that you've given to us because of our union with your Son Jesus Christ. So, Father, we pray for these people and things in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Daniel chapter twelve, verse one is where you should all be. We're going to, as I said before. Uh, have, conduct a little bit of an, o, uh, an overview is what we do. Before we begin each chapter and we go start a new chapter, we always do an overview of the chapter to get a broad outline of the chapter, get general points about the chapter before we go at each verse individually. Uh, a lot of times people like to, uh, for people who are new into the Word of God, it's a good idea is to take uh, the overviews and, 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 you know, give like the book, you know, the book of Daniel, you can give them the overviews of the 12 overviews or whatever we have of the book of Daniel. That's always good. But of course, at some point, you know, eventually we, we need to be, have the discipline and self-discipline to uh, go verse by verse and paragraph by paragraph through the word of God. Uh, we should never, uh, you know, we never should get into the bad habits of, and lazy uh, thinking by uh, and lazy study habits by overlooking certain parts of the Word of God, this I'm not I'm not saying this about just simply about people in the pulp uh, in the um, in the pews. I'm talking about pastors too, because uh, one of the reasons why I go verse by verse is I can't overlook things. I have to when I come up to them, I can't skirt anything and overlook certain things that are difficult or I don't are very controversial or might really shake things up with certain people or in your church and maybe you know you I can't overlook these things I can't ride hobby horses when you go verse by verse one of the dangers of going topical studies exclusively and there's nothing wrong with topical studies meaning studying certain subjects like sanctification justification the trinity which we've done in the past here between books but uh, one of the problems is that when you just do topical studies uh, you can you can miss whole sections of the scripture because one, you are, you don't want to learn it or you don't find it interesting and uh, you overlook it. And then you go to certain subjects over and over again because you find those interesting or you know people find those interesting so you keep teaching those things over and over, recurring things. And one of the things that a lot of guys do is they're always emphasizing, you know, marriage and raising kids. And of course, that's an important subject in the word of God, but uh, there's a whole bunch of other subjects in the Word of God, not just how to raise kids and how you conduct yourself in marriage. And a lot of guys skip over that stuff. And they're congr a lot of people are in, in, that aren't pastors when they study the Bible, they go to the subjects that they find interesting. Uh, there are people who can, you know, uh, they might like certain subjects. Oh, let's, uh, you know, they might like certain subjects, but they won't touch things that are related to, like, justification. They don't find that exciting enough they don't find that they'll therefore they'll go to things like the angelic conflict or something about one of the big things is angels oh well you know i see this on the website you know the, the our document on the angels the angels are being you know it's a big you know it's a it's a subject in the word of god but i don't think it it's important but i don't think it's important more important than the trinity you know yet uh, or justification because that's related to us and sanctification so Again, we don't want to go, it's good to go do broad overviews, we should do that, and it's good to cover, you know, we're going to, you know, we've done this, you know, uh, you, we, there are some books we can, we, you know, we're going to have to cover 
and broad strokes, but uh, um, we can't, you know, we can't, we can't, uh, you know, be lazy and not be disciplined and look at the scriptures verse by verse, paragraph by paragraph, chapter by chapter, and go through a book. It's very important when you begin a book to start the when you start the book and end the book. When you're following along with somebody like Daniel. You know, uh, I know some people, they pick up us, pick us up in the middle of Daniel. That's all right. I mean, but uh, you should be able to have the discipline to, let's say we do, um, we start Daniel, you should stick with it until we finish Daniel. Uh, if we start, you're there when we start, you know, First John or the Gospel of Matthew or Zephaniah or whatever, Isaiah, Isaiah start it with it and finish, you know, start with, uh, finish what you start. Very important that you do that. Because one of the things we do in Bible studies is we can, and this is true with pastors, we can overlook big parts of the scripture and we're only hurting ourselves. All scripture, all scripture is God breathed. God wants you to know about the book of Leviticus. He wants you to know about all these books. And that's why it's important that we go through all of these books and there's different ways to go through them. Uh, I like to go, you know, I try, uh, Go verse by verse. There are sometimes I can do whole paragraphs or even chapters, depending on the book and, and how it's written. Uh, like Exodus, we were able to take many times whole chapters at one time. But uh, nonetheless, we're going through. I'm I'm going through each of these books, and we shouldn't overlook these books. They're in the that we should be teaching these things, and we should be learning these. Uh, I would if you if. You know, you need to uh, learn your Bible. We need to be, te- as pastors, teaching these books, and we should be in the pew learning about these books. And we should definitely be a part of a ministry that's teaching these books. Uh, this is so important because one of the things that's really hurting the church now is a lack of education and what uh, what the uh, the understanding of the New Testament and the Old Testament. Uh, there are some Christians who just learn the New Testament and neglect the Old Testament. Uh, that is wrong. Both testaments are there for our edification. And uh, so therefore, we should never skip, or cho- skip around and cho- pick and choose what we want. And let me tell you something. If you like that, that's a sign that you like your ears tickled. Uh, we live in a, a day and age where we want the abridged, and you've heard me say this, we want things really quick, and we don't want to put the time in. We're in a rush to go nowhere, really. And growing up spiritually to become like Christ means that we have to learn the mind of Christ, and this takes time. Growing up to maturity takes a lot of years, and it's uh, it, and it's just it's something we have to be. Uh, it's not uh, you heard the tortoise and the hare. The race doesn't go to the sw- the, the, the winner does not always go to the swiftest. Some people start really fast in Christianity, but they end and they crash early. Uh, some people start out slow, and they it's how you finish. We should be gr- excelling, getting better and better. A humble person, remember, great. A humble person is teachable. And so uh, an, an arrogant person is not teachable. So uh, you should, and I, I'm saying, that, and, and I, this is uh, for those who are, you know, guilty of these things. I say this in love. I want you, I want you the best for you. So those, for those people who are like that, who are following our website, and they're like this, then this is for you to, to God talking to you to, to change these things. Many of you have been here in front of me, like the Thompsons and the Fletchers and the you know, Pixie out there and uh, George and Alice and, you know, uh, people, they, they are, uh, you know, following it verse by verse every night with me going through these books. And, you know, a lot of you have been done the whole book of Romans, Exodus, Genesis with me, second, third, John, you've done a whole bunch of slew of subjects and you should be very proud of yourself, not to be arrogant and puffed up, but you should be uh, encouraged you know that's very that's excellent that you that you have the discipline to do that because not many people in Christianity can say they've listened to 500 hours of Romans. Uh, I'm not saying that you could have to you have to teach 500 hours to learn the Book of Romans. Uh, you could teach it a lot less if you want. It's just the way I wanted to do the book and how I wanted to teach it. And you might and some people might not like that. And that's fine. Then go to somebody who's going to do it like uh, J. Vernon McGee or something. But uh, and I like J. Vernon McGee, but uh, Again, you should be encouraged, and in, and in, in, uh, it should build your confidence uh, in your knowledge of the scriptures. And uh, I'm, I'm I want to thank you for for being um, faithful and uh, being, um, you know, people who have loved the Word of God and and, and loved the style of teaching. It's called expository type of teaching. I mean, we go through the verse by verse, paragraph by paragraph by paragraph, book by book. We explain 
interpret all the verses in the Bible. So I uh, just wanted to, you know, uh, warn those who are guilty and also encourage those who are uh, going on the right track. So it says in, uh, in, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, what I want to do is read through the whole chapter. It's only 13 verses, and then go uh, through it uh, in, uh, in broad strokes. Uh, it says in Daniel 12, 1, Now at that time, Michael the great prince, who stands guard over the sons of your people, Daniel, will arise, and there'll be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book, will be rescued. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, speaking of resurrection. These to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven, and those who lead the many to righteousness meaning salvation, like the stars forever and ever. But as for you, Daniel, conceal these words and seal up the book until the end, to- end of time. Many will go back and forth and, in- and knowledge will increase. And uh, when we get to that, and I used to think a certain interpretation like a lot of you, and it's not what you think. And uh, we'll go, when, I can't wait till we get to that verse. But uh, a lot of people use this, um, and we'll, when we'll get to it when we, when we get to that verse. When I get back, we'll talk about that in detail. Uh, Verse 5, then he says, Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, two others were standing, one on this bank on the river and the other on that bank of the river. And one said to the man dressed in linen, uh, same one that we saw in chapter 10 who we knew was the pre-incarnate Christ, who was above the waters of the river, the Tigris, how long will it be until the end of these wonders? I heard the man dressed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, as he raised his right hand and his left toward heaven, and swore by him, God, who lives forever, that it would be for a time, times, and a half time, that three and a half year period. And as soon as they finish shattering the power of the holy people, all these events will be completed. As for me, I heard but could not understand. So I said, my Lord, what will be the outcome of these events? And he said, go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed and sealed up until the end time. Many will be purged, purified, and and refined, but the wicked will act wickedly, and none of the wicked will understand. But those who have insight will understand. From the time that the regular sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up, there'll be 1,290 days. Then it says, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit this evening. How blessed is he who keeps waiting and attains to the 1,335 days. And again, uh, there's, if you notice, there's 75 extra days uh, involved here between those two numbers uh, you know, on top of the, 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 the last three and a half years of the 70th week. And as we'll see, that has to do with the preparation for the beginning of the, for the preparation for the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ. So then it goes on to say, but as for you, go your way to the end, then you will enter into rest and rise again for your allotted portion at the end of the age. Notice a couple of mentions, references to resurrection, the resurrection of Old Testament saints. Now, Daniel chapter 11, as well as Daniel chapter 12, record Daniel receiving from God uh, through an unidentified elect angel the final great prophetic revelation of his life. Remember, he received, he had four of them. Uh, actually, one through Nebuchadnezzar. God gave it to Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 2, and Daniel was given the information as well. Uh, we saw one in chapter 7. We saw one in chapter 8, and we saw with uh, we also saw the, uh, the one in chapter... Uh, actually, uh, you can't count... Uh, the one, Nebuchadnezzar got chapter 2, Daniel interpreted it, and uh, God gave him the information about it, but Nebuchadnezzar got that revelation in chapter 2. Daniel got revelation in Daniel chapter uh, 7, and also 8 and 9, and also we see in verses uh, chapters 11 and 12. So he had four great prophetic revelations. I'm not counting the one in chapter 2, because that was initially given to Nebuchadnezzar. So what we have here is chapter 12 and chapter 11 go together, as we pointed out, and that constitutes the fourth great uh, final prophetic revelation of Daniel's life. Now, he received this fourth and final prophetic uh, revelation from God in 536 BC, as we pointed out, during the third year of the reign of the Cyrus, king of Persia, as we noted in our study of Daniel chapter 10. So Daniel chapter 12 continues this prophecy, which began in chapter 11, by presenting the prophecy of the last 1,335 days, which includes, as we'll say, the last three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week, the second advent of Jesus Christ, and the establishment 
of his, sub, his subsequent millennial reign on the earth. Now, in the first three verses of Daniel chapter 12, which we read, we have the prophecy of Israel being delivered from the power of the Antichrist and Satan by the intervention of the elect angel Michael, who is the elect angel who personally defends the nation of Israel from Satan and his kingdom. We saw Michael mentioned in Daniel chapter 10, verses 13 and 21, and he was said to be the ruler over Israel there. He's an angelic ruler over Israel. He's, he's elect angel. He's the only elect angel that's mentioned in Scripture that is actually defending a nation, a group of people uh, for God, and that's the Jewish people. And again, the reason why that, has, that, that is, that God has put Michael as a protector over the Jewish people to see that they're not exterminated by Satan, is that God's going to, he's going to establish his kingdom through the Jews bodily on the earth. Jesus is a Jew, and the, the nation of Israel, composed of regenerate Jews, are going to be the head of the nations during the millennial kingdom. So it's, that's why they're persecuted. Uh, the church is persecuted because we're a part of that kingdom as well. So God's trying to establish his kingdom on the earth, and he will be successful with the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. So Michael, uh, see, as we pointed out in chapter 10, uh, Satan is the god of this world. He deceives the entire world, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, 1 John 5.19, Revelation 12.10, and he, we saw that he has demon officers, Satan does, because he's the god of this world temporarily, he's got demon officers uh, under his, him, commanders, who are over the nations of the earth, and uh, including our own country. Israel is the one nation that doesn't have a satanic ruler over it. We have Michael. We have an elect angel uh, who is over the nation of Israel protecting her, seeing, seeing to it that the, na the nation of Israel is not exterminated by Satan and the Antichrist and uh, is allowed to continue to exist because God is going to establish his kingdom through the Jewish people. The fact that that's the, that's the case tells us there's a future for the Jews and that the church uh, has not replaced Israel. Israel, there's teaching, as I told you in the past, called replacement theology. It's very important you know this uh, because it leads to a lot of... Um, uh, bad treatment of the Jews in the church's history. Uh, the Jewish people are st still the people of God. There's a future for them, as Paul, we saw that in Romans 9, 10, and 11. Paul says God has not rejected his people, Israel. He has a future for them, and the unconditional nature of the four covenants to Israel, the Abrahamic, Palestinian, Davidic, a new covenant, guarantees the future of the nation of Israel. Thus, the church could not be the new Israel. We're a different entity than the nation of Israel. So Michael is the elect angel of God who is a ruler angel. He's an archangel. Archangel means he's a ruler angel. And he is uh, watching over the nation, of the Jewish people. Now, uh, when the Jewish people left the land, he was still watching over those people as they were dispersed into Babylon and the nations of the earth. And he was watching over them for the last two centuries, uh, 2,000 years before they got back in the land in 1948. And he continues to watch over the Jewish people and protect them. And uh, despite all the great persecutions, the Jews still have survived and that's because of angelic protection that God has uh, uh, assigned to the nation of Israel. So look at Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, please. It says, Now at that time, Michael, the great prince, who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise, and there'll be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And in that time, your people, everyone who's found written the book, will be rescued. Now, Michael, we've seen this in the past. Again, he's an elect angel. Uh, he is an angelic ruler over the nation of Israel. And Daniel 12, 1 says that Michael stands guard over the Jewish people. His name, it's quite interesting. I, this is a rebuke. His name is a rebuke to Satan because his name means who is like God. That's what his name means. Michael means who is like God. And it, I always liked that name. If I had a kid, I was gonna, I, I'd like to name my kid Michael. And, and if I had three other boys, I'd call them Shem, Ham, and J Japheth, or Mo, Larry, and Curly. I can't remember which. But anyways, his name, who is like God, who is like God, is a rebuke to Satan because uh, it's, it actually poses, his name poses a rhetorical question that demands a negative answer. Who is like God means there's no one. And so uh, there's no one that uh, compares to God, and that's what Michael's name means. And this is significant because this angel's very name, Michael, 
it, uh, who's, uh, he, uh, his presence stands as a rebuke and a refutation to Satan's boast in Isaiah 14 that I will, I will make myself like the most high. I will be like, which means I will be like God. Satan said that in Isaiah 14, 14. Well, Michael's name is a rebuke to that. And as we'll see in Revelation 12, Michael's going to bodily throw uh, uh, Satan and his, uh, his uh, fallen angels out of heaven in the midway point of the tribulation period, which this Daniel 12, 1 is talking about. So we have here that Michael, you know, he's, uh, his name it stands as a rebuke, a rebuke to Satan and his boast, I will be like God. So in Daniel 12, 1, we see that he's, Michael's called the great prince, and in Jude 9, he's the archangel, the first of the chief of the angels. So he's a ruler angel. Uh, that we don't know a lot about the angels. We don't have. There's a book called Enoch, which is quite interesting, and actually Jude quotes from it. So, uh, but uh, it's quite interesting. They mention a lot of names of angels. It's not an inspired book, not considered by the Jews and, and the church as to be inspired. But it has a lot of interest. It's a Jewish book. It's interesting names about the elect angels, and they give you know different names of the certain elect angels, like Raphael, I think, is one of them, and. But uh, so it's, but it's uh, quite interesting. But it's not inspired by God, so we can't really trust its, uh, you know, its information about the angels. There's only two names of two angels that we know their names of: Gabriel and Michael. Michael is related to Israel, and uh, Gabriel seems to be, you know, related to the plan of salvation. He's there to announce the birth of Christ, talk to Mary and Joseph uh, about the incarnation. So he's related to. Uh, the uh, the first advent of Jesus Christ. So those are the two only two angels we know by name. Of course, it's interesting. Satan, we don't know his personal name. Uh, he's got the titles. Uh, Satan and D devil are titles. Uh, the uh, I know some people say, well, isn't his name Lucifer? No, no. Uh, what what Lucifer is actually what it is is, is I think it's taken from the Latin is what it is. Uh, Lucifer is uh, talking about. Uh, uh, in the Hebrew text, uh, I think it's Isaiah, he's called a bright shining one. And uh, so Lucifer is basically um, a transliteration from the Latin of that uh, in, uh, translation of the Hebrew expression, you know, the bright shining one. Uh, that's what, you know, Satan is actually described as the bright shining one in Scripture. So Lucifer is a name that they, is basically a, trans, a translation of that Hebrew expression. So we don't, in other words, we don't know the guy, the, the angel's personal name. And for all I know, it could be, maybe that is his, bright, his, 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 his personal name, bright shining one. I, I don't know. But uh, it's not like a personal name like Michael or Gabriel. So therefore, I don't think God has saw fit to give uh, his personal name up. So uh, Michael defends the Jews as we see. He will defend the Jews in the tribulation from the wrath of Satan. In Revelation 12, 1 through 8, which should be compared with Daniel 12, 1, we see that Michael and his angels, meaning those angels under his authority, uh, it appears that in this passage, uh, Michael, became, who is the chief commander and leader of the holy angels, uh, after Satan's fall, uh, is used by God to um, remove Satan and the fallen angels from heaven, the throne room of God, which implies clearly that Satan has access to heaven. Uh, how could he be thrown out if he doesn't have access? Some people think, oh, the devil's in hell now. No, he's the God of this world, and he has access to the throne room of God. And what does he do there? He, 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 what? he accuses the brethren day and night, Revelation 12, 10. Zechariah 3, he accused the Jewish high priest in the throne room of God. And who's 1 John 2, 1 say? Jesus Christ is our great advocate, our defense attorney with the Father. I was talking to Titus about that. He said, yeah, Satan and devil, those names are like legal titles. He's a lawyer. And then, you know, Titus goes, well, we got the best lawyer, Jesus Christ. You know, our advocate was like, yep, we got the best, best, best lawyer right there is Jesus Christ. So that means, in a way, not all of our lawyers are bad. <laughs> so anyways, well, wait, till we get to, uh, get, wait till we get to Titus. At the end of Titus, uh, there's a guy named Zenus. He's a lawyer. And so there's a, there's a good lawyer in, in Scripture. So it's, <laughs> some people think all lawyers are bad. And, uh, of course, they're not. But uh, so uh, we see here that uh, Michael is going to be used by God to uh, bodily remove Satan from the throne room of God. During the midway point of Daniel's 70th week, Michael the archangel and his legions of elect angels will expel Satan and his legions from heaven. So hold your place and uh, uh, look at Revelation chapter 12. Look at verse 1, please.
Revelation 12, 1, a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. That's all symbolic language of real people. Uh, we see that the woman is, is Israel. The sun would be uh, uh, Jacob, and the moon would be his, uh, the women he had children through. Uh, we have the 12 stars of the 12 sons of Jacob who became the nation of Israel. And so it says she, Israel, was with child, and she cried out, being in labor and pain to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems. This, of course, this dragon is, of course, Satan. The seven heads speak of the great world empires, the Gentile empires that are, have been uh, uh, Inst his creation, really, uh, you know, you have the major empires we talked about, Babylon, Medo, Persia, uh, Greece, Rome, uh, the final stage of the Roman Empire is, is designated by the ten horns. Uh, you can throw in Egypt and Assyria in there as well with the seven heads. So uh, we see here, there's Satan mentioned there, and then it says in verse 4, in his tail, uh, this is a very brief reference to the fall of the angels here, and his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven, that's the, the angels, and, uh, and threw them to the earth. Uh, that's, again, we're speaking in the context of Satan, and the stars of heaven speak of the angels, so one third of the angels fell with Satan. Now, it's interesting, and this is a, just a brief aside, is that if you look at the, uh, the, 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 the high priest in Israel, remember we talked about this in Exodus, we, I think we, we uh, in the breastplate, you know, the, you know, we have the 12 jewels, right? On the, on the breastplate of the high priest, and they represent that each of the 12 tribes of Israel that are over the heart of God. You know, they're in the heart of God. God thinks about and cares for them. Well, if you notice description of Satan in Ezekiel 28, which talks about his fall, verses 11 through 19, there's nine, he's adorned with nine jewels. And the nine jewels, I believe, represent the nine tribes of angels. And it's saying that one-third of these angels fell. So we talked about that in the past in Exodus and some other places, I think, in the Day of the Lord series. But so there we have, in the tail, his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman Israel who was about to give birth so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. And we know the child is Christ. And she gave birth to a son, a male child. How do we know he's Christ? Well, it says, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, who we know in Scripture is said to be described as doing that, Jesus. And her child was caught up to, the, to God and his throne. That's the uh, ascension of Jesus Christ where he sits at the right hand of the Father now. So there's the ascension of Christ there. Then the woman, and then we said there's a, there's a, a, a time gap here between verses 5 and 6 because verse 6 describes, uh, verse 5 describes the first advent of Jesus. At 2,000 years ago, and verse 6, as we read, is obviously describing the tribulation period. Then it says, because of the 1,260 days. So there's a time gap there in the prophecy. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God so that there would, she would be nourished for 1,260 days. Remember in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, Jesus said, when you see the abomination of desolation, flee to the mountains, the hills. Well, that's what he's being referenced there. So Israel will, when Antichrist does the desecration of the temple, many of the Jews, most of the Jews, are going to hightail it to the hills, uh, you know, probably Masada and other places like they're hiding out uh, like their forefathers did, like David, from the Antichrist. So uh, then it says in verse 7, and there was war in heaven, and then it says, and Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon, Satan, and the dragon and his angels waged war. This is war in heaven. Now, here's something to think about. We are raptured before this takes place. We're in heaven. What are the three great events that happen in heaven? Uh, we have, we, we get our resurrection bodies. We get the Bema seat. We see who gets rewards. We have the, mar we're married to Jesus Christ. While that's going on, um, the, we see that, uh, you know, Satan is uh, still going to have access to heaven when we're in heaven. So, I think we might see uh, Satan when we're in heaven uh, in this. We, maybe we will. Uh, I'm inclined to believe that we will. With the bride of Christ, I'm sure. I think we'll be seeing him uh, at that time. So it's something quite interesting to look, I don't know. I don't know if you should be looking forward to it, but it'd be quite uh, interesting and fascinating to see who the person is that has been such a, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the adversary of God and the adversary of us who's trying to wipe us and kill us all off. 
Uh, so it's quite interesting. And we're going to, so we're in heaven when this is all happening. So we're probably going to be witness to this, this war, which is quite interesting. I, you know, uh, uh, doesn't say we're going to see the war, but I would think that we would because where are we? We're in heaven and this war is going to be in heaven. But it, it looks, it obviously, uh, Satan doesn't, is not going to be able to, uh, defeat Michael. He's, oh, he has, he doesn't have the power that Mike, Satan doesn't have the power. His angels don't have the power that Michael and his angels have. There's more angel, elect angels than of, of following with Michael than there are uh, following Satan. So the numbers are, are against Satan here. So it says, and there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. So that means, again, they have access to heaven as we speak. Job chapters 1 and 2, we see that clearly uh, Satan has access to heaven and the elect angels. What God does is you read, if you read Job 1 and 2, God calls an assembly, it's a roll call, and the fallen angels have to show up too. In fact, if you read some stuff in the Old Testament, uh, there's, uh, there's instances where God says to a, a demon, a fallen angel, uh, who will go and deceive this particular king in Israel? or whatever, some king in Syria. And he says, I will. What are you going to do? Well, I'm going to do this. Then go ahead and do that. <laughs> it's just, so they have, they're accountable to God, is what I'm saying. And I always found this great encouragement because whatever happens to us, God has permitted it and he would never permit. Satan just can't go do anything he wants. And he doesn't want you to think that because he, he wants you to live in fear of him. Now, listen to me, balance it. You should have a healthy respect for him like, Michael did when he fought over the body of Moses in Jude 9. He didn't make a railing accusation against Satan. You should never show disrespect for the fallen angels like Satan. Uh, you, you, you should uh, communicate what the word of God has to say, but you shouldn't be one of these people that is, you know, uh, going hoopy in, uh, on uh, Satan and stuff. He still has authority, but they have, they're accountable. They have, a, they have to assemble in heaven for God, and he, has, and he get, holds them accountable. Satan, where have you been? Going to and from, to and fro around the earth. So he, he has to give an account to God, which, I'm, which obviously we know his attitude toward God. He hates that. He hates that. So they're going to be gone from heaven at this point. They're going to be expelled from heaven for good. So then it says in verse 9, the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who was called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. Uh, at, you know, you want to know why there's atheism is big and evolution and anti-Christian sentiment and anti-Bible sentiment. We're in the devil's world. He's deceiving the whole world. And he was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. When is this going to happen? It's in the context of the, the 1260 days, the, the last three and a half years, the 70th week. So it's interesting. When Antichrist desecrates the temple halfway through the, the 70th week, right? I believe what's going to prompt that to set that off is Satan will be expelled from heaven at that time and the first order of business on earth is saying, get in that temple and deify yourself and to shake your fist at God because I'm ticked off at God right here. I believe that's exactly what's happening. So it, they're all connected here. So then it goes on to say that uh, it, you know, God's kingdom is about to be established on the earth. So uh, there we have... Uh, uh, we have read what we read about in Daniel twelve one. We compare it what we just read in Daniel uh, Revelation chapter twelve uh, one through nine, because it, both verses are talking about uh, Michael uh, defeating Satan and his angels. My, well, actually, if you go back to Daniel chapter twelve, both passages Daniel twelve one and then what we just read it was Revelation twelve six through nine, uh, speaking of the final three and a half years of the seventieth week, and Michael. Uh, we know from Revelation, it gives us more information about Daniel 12. 1, it's telling us, when it says, Michael will rise, who stands God of your sons of your people, in Daniel 12. 1, it basically, it's explained for us in greater detail in Revelation 12, 6 through 9, namely that Michael's going to uh, uh, d defend Israel against, uh, from Satan. He's going to defend Israel against, uh, from the onslaughts of Satan. So, go back, please, now to Daniel chapter 12, please. Verse 1. Daniel 12, 1. Hopefully you held your place. So it says, Now at that time, Michael, the great prince, who stands God over the sons of your people, will arise, and there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. 
Now, that phrase, a time of distress, such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time, is a reference to the last three and a half years of the 70th week, which is prophesied about in Daniel 9.27 and will be terminated with the second advent of Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus Christ calls it the great tribulation in his Olivet Discourse. Hold your place. Go to Matthew 24. We're going to be running around here a bit around the Bible. So look at Matthew 24. Look at verse 15. Matthew 24, 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of, of, spoken of through the prophet, the, uh, prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Uh, we read about that in Revelation 12, right? Remember that? Whoever's on the housetop must not go down to get the things that are in his house. This is all about during the tribulation period when the Antichrist desecrates the temple. It's all taught, spoke, speaking to the Jews. Whoever's in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. Just run for the hills, he's saying. Like uh, Lot was told in his family, and his wife looked back, and she died. <laughs> but woe to those who were pregnant and to those who were nursing babies in those days. But pray that your, your flight will be not in the winter or on a Sabbath. For then, for then, remember, it's point, for then, it's pointing back to the abomination of desolation being set up in verse 15. Then there will be great tribulation. And that's what the second prophetic statement in Daniel 12.1 is referring to here. For then there'll be great tribulation, the last three and a half years of the 70th week, such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. So go back, please, to Daniel 12.1. So then, right after that, the other statement that follows it, the third prophetic statement, and at that time, your people, everyone is found written in the book, will be rescued, uh, that refers to the deliverance of those Jews who have exercised faith in Jesus Christ, the Savior, which will take place at the second advent of Jesus Christ. Remember, we read that in Zechariah 12 and 14, this deliverance. Paul actually refers to it. Uh, hold your place. Look at Romans chapter 11. Hold your place. Look at Romans 11 now. Look at verse 25. I'm just finishing up an article on um, Romans chapter 11 and the future of the nation of Israel. So Revelation 11, excuse me, Romans, book of Romans, Romans 11.25. For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery. What's that? So that you will not be as wise in your own estimation, meaning you Gentiles don't be arrogant toward the Jews who have rejected Christ, and you're, don't be wise in your own estimation, meaning don't think your race is better than the Jewish race, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel. And that's what's happened at this time in history. Until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, meaning the full number of Gentiles comes in, then you have, we have, uh, the, uh, the, then we have the, the Jews being dealt with. Then it says in verse 26, and so all Israel will be saved. Just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion and he will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So it's speaking of the national regeneration of Israel and restoration of Israel. Uh, and uh, that is going to happen at the second advent of Jesus Christ. So that, if you go back to Daniel 12, 1 now, when it says in the third prophetic statement, and at that time your people, everyone who's found written in the book, will be rescued. At what time? At the time, at the end of the, se the 70th week. The last three and a half years, Christ's second advent ends it, as we saw in the Olivet Discourse. Ends the tribulation period. So at that time, your people, who's Daniel's people, the Jews, he's not talking about the church, your people, Daniel, the Jews, everyone who's found written in the book, that's the reference to the book of life, meaning everyone who is saved, will be rescued at that time. And that, as we'll see when we get to it, is a spiritual deliverance and a physical bodily deliverance in the sense that the spiritual deliverance, meaning they'll have it through faith in Jesus Christ at the second advent, be delivered from eternal condemnation and the wrath of God and the lake of fire, and they'll be delivered bodily by Jesus from the tribulational armies in Satan and Antichrist at, this, at his second advent. Now, tw Daniel 12, 2, speaks of the resurrection of regenerate Israel born again Israel at the second advent and the resurrection of unregenerate Israel for eternal condemnation 
which will take place at the great white throne judgment. So look at Rev uh, Daniel 12, 2 now. Daniel 12, 2. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake. These to everlasting life. Notice that the life is everlasting. But to the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Notice that the contempt is, uh, is, uh, is and the disgrace is everlasting. Notice the everlasting contempt. So there's, that's another passage that could be used to refute annihilationism. Remember, that is uh, the teaching that when an unbeliever dies, he no longer exists. He's just simply extinguished. He no longer exists. This says that's not the case. So then it says in verse 3, those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven, and those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Now, the Old Testament, like this passage, associated confident expectation of resurrection with the second advent of Jesus Christ. Meaning, when Jesus comes back at his second advent, Old Testament saints will be raised, like Daniel. So Daniel 12, 2 we have the resurrection of Old Testament believers is seen to be an event that is subsequent to the 70th week of Daniel when Antichrist is reigning. It seems it, it's occurring with the second advent of Jesus Christ. So when it says your people, remember, that's a reference to the nation of Israel because Daniel was a member of that nation. And then the statement, everyone who's found written in the book will be rescued, that refers to those born-again Jews who will be rescued from the Western and Eastern Confederacies uh, at the second advent of Christ. The Western Confederacies, meaning e uh, Antichrist, uh, uh, Roman, uh, 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 final stage of the Roman Empire, and uh, the Eastern Confederacies, speaking of those Eastern armies uh, from China that we heard coming across the Euphrates and Revelation 16, 12. Now the statement, many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake and these to everlasting life, that's teaching us that born-again Jews, believers in, of the Jews, they who had died, will be raised from the dead, subsequent to the nation of Israel's deliverance from the tribulation period. So again, when Christ comes back at his second advent, he's going to destroy, uh, he's going to destroy the tribulational armies, kill Antichrist, throw them in the lake fire with a false prophet, imprison Satan, and he's also going to, at that time, resurrect Old Testament saints like Daniel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they'll come into the kingdom that they were promised and they waited for all these centuries. So the, uh, the statement, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt, that refers to those non-believers in Israel who will be raised from the dead subsequent to Israel's deliverance by the second advent of Jesus Christ. But in contrast to the believers, they will suffer eternal condemnation in the lake of fire. We know that because uh, the contempt is everlasting and it parallels the, the, the life which is everlasting. So if... Uh, the person was, uh, if it was true that a person, when, an unbeliever, when they died, that they just don't longer exist, this would not be, they would not be described as experiencing this contempt. The contempt would be momentary and they're dead, they're gone, they're ex extinguished, they no longer exist. But this is saying it's everlasting. So that's just another, a, another uh, thing to keep in mind. Now, Revelation 24, Revelation 20, chapter 20, verse 4 teaches that subsequent to the second advent of Jesus Christ, when Satan is thrown into prison for a thousand years, both Jewish and Gentile believers who died for the cause of Jesus Christ during the tribulation period will be raised from the dead to reign with Christ during his millennial reign. Hold your place. Look at Revelation chapter 20, verse 1, please. Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven. This is all it's describing events at the second advent. Holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. The abyss is basically a prison cell for, the, for the, uh, the fallen angels. And he laid one of them. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would no longer deceive the nations until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. I think last night I said the second advent of Christ would be uh, Satan's uh, Waterloo. Now, technically, that's incorrect. I was look, listening. You know, you know, actually, his Waterloo is described in, uh, in um, Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 through 9. 
uh, his last last final shot at beating God, he gets defeated. So that's more uh, that's his Waterloo is what I would say. Waterloo is remember Napoleon's final battle, final defeat. He kind of come back from exile and try to uh, come back and beat the British and Wellington beat him and great battles. Good thing to read about. Verse four down, Revelation twenty. Chapter 20, verse 4, Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image. So these are people who died for their faith in Jesus during the tribulation and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand, and they came to life, resurrection, and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So Daniel uh, chapter 12, verse 3, is speaking of that resurrection uh, as well. So go back, please, now, to Daniel chapter 12. So to give you, and we'll talk about this when we get to it in, in detail, the chronolo- the, as far as God's resurrection program, here's the order of the resurrections. Uh, for instance, Revel- if you notice in Revelation, was it Revelation 20, uh, talks about a first resurrection and a second resurrection. Well, it's talking about the, sec- uh, the, the you know the uh, the second death and the fir- the first. There's 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 several resurrection. God is there's a resurrection of Old Testament uh, uh, non uh, non believers. There's a resurrection of them. They're going to be uh, going to the lake of fire. They they go to the great white throne judgment and then the lake of fire. But believers, depending on what dispensation you were, get raised at different times. Uh, we don't get raised at the end of history that the, the unbelievers do. We get our resurrection bodies. Actually, we're the next in line to get our resurrection body. We're the next. And the reason why that is is because rank has its privileges. Uh, Old Testament Jews or Gentiles who are believers, they're not the bride of Christ. We are the church. We're clearly said to be the bride of Christ, the church is. So because of we're in, married to Jesus Christ and union with him, we're the next one to get our resurrection bodies. He's the first fruits in resurrection. Remember Paul said that in 1 Corinthians 15. We're, we're part of that uh, first resurrection. So the f- chronological order of the res- God's resurrection program, program is this. First of all, Jesus Christ is the first one raised from the dead. Uh, others who were raised from the dead, and people Jesus raised from the dead, like Lazarus, were resuscitated. Uh, when, re- when we talk about resurrection, it's a change of your body. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, the mortal must put on immortality, and the perishable must put on the imperishable. So uh, we see that uh, Jesus is the first one to get a resurrection body. All those who were, came back to life like Lazarus, they lived to die again because they didn't get an immortal body at that time. So when we talk about resurrection, we're talking about this body that we're going to get that's going to be immortal. And Jesus is the first one. He's the first human being. I mean, he's the God man to get this resurrection body. And then we have the church. The resurrection of the church is called the rapture by theologians. And that's talked about in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 57, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. You know these passages. Philippians 3, 20 and 21 talks about the church being raised from the dead. This is imminent. This could happen tonight. could happen while I'm speaking. We're the next ones to go up. Then after that, we have what we've been reading, around, reading about in Revelation 20 and Daniel 12 too. We have the resurrection of Old Testament believers and tribulational martyrs, people who were uh, lived during the tribulation, whether they were Jew or Gentile, they trusted in Jesus, and they died for their faith, they're going to be raised from the dead at the second advent of Christ, along with people like Moses and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the great Jews of history, and some Gentiles in there too, like uh, Melchizedek, remember a guy, a guy like him. So then we have after that, the uh, fourth group would be the every non-believer in human history uh, will go to the great white throne judgment. They get a resurrection body. That's clear from what we see in Daniel 12 too. The unbelievers in Israel get their a body, a resurrection body that enables them to suffer eternal condemnation in the lake of fire. So the, the bodies that human beings have, unbelievers have now, would not be able to endure eternal punishment the way they're presently constituted. So evidently he gives them a body that will allow them to suffer this, this pain and torment in the lake of fire. It's a horrible thought, but uh, should motivate us to evangelize. So there'll be two judgments conducted by the Lord Jesus Christ immediately after his second advent and just prior to his millennial reign. 
In fact, only believers will be living at the start of the millennial reign of our Lord as a result of these judgments. So again, remember, they'll be at the second advent of Christ. They're immediately followed by judgments. Two judgments. Uh, judgment of the, Gen the Jews first and then the Gentiles. And that, as a result, only believers will start off the millennial kingdom. So you read in Revelation, in tw Revelation 20, you know, there's a million, the, the earth is repopulated. They're the offspring of those who survived the tribulation period. That were believers. They had children. So again, back it up here. Christ comes back in the second advent. If you're a Jew or Gentile and you're a believer in Jesus and you're alive and you survived the tribulation and you saw Jesus come back, you go to this judgment and he, the sheep's in the goat passage in, in Matthew, uh, the, the, the sheep on his right, they go into the kingdom. The goats don't go in because they, re they rejected him. Uh, then you have uh, Jewish believers. They go into the kingdom. Jewish unbelievers are removed from the earth. They go to torments and then the great white throne. So only believers start off the millennium, and those at that time who survived the tribulation period, they don't get their resurrection bodies immediately because they're the ones that are going to repopulate the earth. They get their resurrection bodies sometime at the, at the end of the millennial kingdom sometime. So they're the ones that have to repopulate the earth. They got the fun job of doing that. So they, uh, they're going to, uh, we see here that these, those uh, Israelites and Gentiles who reject Jesus Christ as Savior are removed from the earth, whereas those who trust in him as Savior will enter the millennial kingdom. Now, the judgment of those Israelites who survived the tribulation is referred to in Ezekiel chapter 20, verses 33 through 37, and Malachi 3, 2 through 6, and Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46, speaks of the judgment of those Gentiles who survived the tribulation period. So uh, uh, go over to Ezekiel, please. Go to Ezekiel chapter 20, please. Ezekiel chapter 20, look at verse 33. As I live, declares the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, and with wrath poured out, I shall be king over you. And I will bring you out from the peoples and gather you from the lands where you were scattered with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples and there I will enter into judgment with you face to face. As I entered into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so I will enter into judgment with you, declares the Lord God. I will make you pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. Now look what he says. And I will purge from you the rebels, the unbelievers in Israel, and those who transgress me. I will bring them out of the land where they sojourn, but they will not enter the land of Israel. Thus you will know that I am the Lord. So there's the judgment of the Jews that is immediately subsequent to the uh, second advent of Christ. And uh, in fact, uh, you notice the, what is it, the 1,335 days? Actually, that's related to this judgment. There's going to be a 45-day period in which Jesus is judging the Jews and the Gentiles who survived the tribulation period. You also have uh, the, temp, the first the 30 days immediately after the end of the tribulation, they're, de they're, the, uh, they're rededicating the temple. They're reconsecrating the temple and actually pro probably building the millennial temple because it's much bigger, than I'm sure, than the, the, the tribulational temple. So the, uh, now Ma uh, go over to Matthew. That's where I want to show you. Go to Matthew 25 now. So there's the Jews' judgment after the second advent, immediately after. Go to Matthew 25. Now we get the Gentiles. And actually, uh, I don't have time to read it all, but it, Matthew 25, 1 through 30, is speaking of the judgment of the Jews, all right? The first 30 verses. Then you get into verses 31 through 46, the judgment of the Gentiles. I uh, probably should have gone to that first rather than the Ezekiel passage, but you probably didn't know that one as well as this. So the first, the first again, the first 30 verses of Matthew 25 is speaking of God's judgment of the Jews subsequent to the second advent. Then we get verses 31 through 46, we have the judgment of the Gentiles. 
which follows his judgment of the Jews. So that there's going to be a 45 day period where he's going to the surviving Jews and Gentiles on the earth are going to stand under judgment of Jesus Christ. And of course, we're going to see this because we're the bride of Christ. So uh, amazing things we're going to see in the future. Just you know, my head shaking here thinking about it. Um, spinning, I should say. Look at verse 31. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory at his second advent, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another, as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on, his, on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come to you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. And I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. And I was sick, and you visited me. And I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when do we see you hungry, and feed you, or thirsty, or give you something to drink? And when, he, we, and when do we see you a stranger, and invite you in, or naked, and clothe you? When do we see you sick, or in prison, and come to you? The king will answer, that's Jesus, of course, he will answer and say to them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, speaking of the Jews, even the least of them, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, you did not visit me. Then they will answer themselves, they themselves will also answer, Lord, when do we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them. Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of these, the least of, least of these, you did not do it to me. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Basically what he's saying is their faith in him is manifested in their treatment to his people. Uh, the lack of faith is manifested in their failure to treat well his pe God's people. So there's the judgment. And notice that uh, we see that the punishment is eternal again. And it's in parallel with life. Life is eternal that the, the righteous get. But the punishment is eternal for the non-Christian. So now we see that the, it's interesting. And we'll, when we get to this, we'll talk about this in more detail when we get to this verse. But the chronology of prophesied events of, by our Lord in Matthew 24 and 25 indicates that the Lord Jesus Christ will judge Israel immediately upon returning at his second advent. And then after that, he will judge the Gentiles, as I pointed out to you. So the chronology of events listed in Matthew 24 and 25 are as follows. One, we have the first three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week in verses 4 through 6 of Daniel 24. The last three and a half years of the 70th week are mentioned in Matthew 24, 7 through 28. And then number three, the second advent of Jesus Christ is mentioned in verses 29 and 30 of Matthew 24. Then in the fourth uh, part of this chapter, of these two chapters, we have the elect angels will regather Israel. And that's Matthew 24, 31. Then the Lord Jesus Christ will judge Israel, as I pointed out to you in first 30 verses of chapter 25. And then lastly, uh, excuse me, uh, six, uh, the sixth uh, stage of this uh, uh, chronology of events, we have Jesus judging the Gentiles, as we just read, in verses 31 through 46. And then number seven, we have the millennial kingdom. So in Daniel chapter 12, verses 4 through 13, we have the conclusion of the book. So go back to Daniel 12, 4, and we'll close. So if you notice, the first three, chap three, three, first three verses of chapter 12 got a ton of theology in them. It's got a ton of stuff in it, so it's going to be cool to go over. So Daniel 12, 4 through 13, we have the conclusion of the book. In verse 4, we have the angel instructing Daniel to seal this fourth and final prophetic revelation of his life. Daniel 12, 4, but as for you, Daniel, conceal these words, terrible translation. He's not saying that because he wrote this book and published it to the, for the Jews and the Gentiles to read. <laughs> conceal these words, no, it means to seal up these words in a, basically put them in writing on a scroll and seal up the scroll. That's what they did in the ancient world with important documents to save for future generations. So he's basically saying, preserve it in writing and seal it up and protect it because it's for your people in the future. But as for you, Daniel, I think even the Net Bible 
kind of blows that uh, translation conceal out of the water. Conceal, uh, conceal these words or another seal them up. Seal up the book until the end of time. And many will go back and forth and knowledge will increase. Now that's, uh, that is, I'll tell you right now, I can't tell you, get into detail because we don't have time. But that's not talking about what, you know, that we're in the time where all this knowledge is increasing. It not, has nothing to do with that. So we'll get, I'll show you in detail. It has nothing to do with that at all. Now look at verse 5. Verses 5 through 13, we have a dialogue between two elect angels and the pre-incarnate Christ. Uh, and uh, which the two angels ask the Lord, the man dressed in linen, they ask him questions about the, three and a, the last three and a half years of the 70th week. So it says in verse 5, Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, two others were standing, one on this bank of the river and the other on that bank of the river. And one said to the man dressed in linen who was above the waters of the river, How long will it be until the end of these wonders? That, speaking of the prophetic events, and Daniel 11.36 to Daniel 12.3. Uh, then I heard the man dressed in linen who was above the waters of the river. Remember, saw in Daniel 10, he's the Lord, the pre-incarnate Christ. As he raised his right hand and his left toward heaven and swore by him, that would be the Father, who lives forever, that it would be for a time's time and a half time, three and a half years. And as soon as they finish shattering the, the power of the holy people, the Jews, all these events will be completed. As for me, I heard but could not understand, so I said, my Lord, now Daniel explains what he doesn't understand, because it's interesting, in Daniel 10.1, he says he understands this whole revelation, but then when he gets here, it sounds like he's contradicting himself, well, his question tells you what he doesn't understand, he doesn't know what follows these events, he knows what these events are, but he doesn't know what comes after them, because unlike prophets later to Daniel, he didn't know a lot about the details after the second advent. He's talk, he, he got a lot of revelation about the tribulation period and everything and the second advent, but he didn't have a lot of information out after that time. He knew there's going to be a millennial kingdom, but he didn't have a lot of details. So look at his question. My Lord, what will be the outcome of these events? Meaning what's, what's after these events is actually what it says. He said, go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed and sealed up until the end time. Many will be purged, purified, and refined, but the wicked will act wickedly, and none of the wicked will understand, but those who have insight will understand. From the, basically, whoever reads this, the prophecies of the New Testament, the uh, revelation of the second, the tribulation period, and the Antichrist, and the second advent of Christ, and these judgments that follow in the millennial kingdom, the people who understand the revelation in this Book of Daniel 2, they'll, they'll have insight. And from the, then verse 11, from the time that the regular sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up, there'll be 1,290 days. Uh, to be brief with that, we'll go into that in detail, but the 1,290 days, it means there's 30 days tacked on to the last three and a half years of the 70th week. What are those 30 days being used for? Well, he's speaking in the context of the temple. Regular sacrifice is abolished from the time of the regular sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up, speaking of things that will take place in the temple. So when he talks about the 1290 days, in particular the 30 days that follow the tribulation period, he's speaking of the temple. What could be happening to the temple during those 30 days? They re-consecrate it uh, they, they, because it's been desecrated. So they fix up the temple so that Jesus Christ can uh, rule in this temple. In fact, Ezekiel 40, chapter 40, all the way to chapter 48, describes in detail the millennial temple. In fact, I believe that because of the war and everything, there's not going to be really much left to this temple, I, I would think. They're going to build, a, it's in Ezekiel 40 through 48, those chapters. It describes this millennial temple in detail. I think we touched upon this in our Day of the Lord series. So that 1290 days, the 30 days following the tribulation period, is being used to reconsecrate the temple, we would say. Then it says, how blessed is he who keeps waiting to attain to the 1,335 days. Now, there's 45 days there tacked on to the 30 days that are used to, to reconsecrate the temple. What's those 45 days going to be used? The judgments we read about. It's going to take some time. It's going to take 45 days, it appears, to do. Because how do we know it's to do with the judgments? Because it says... How blessed is he who keeps waiting and attains to the 1,335 days. Meaning they make it. They're happy because they're going to go through the millennial kingdom. If you make it through the judgments, that means you're going into the kingdom. If you didn't, you're going to the torments, lake of fire. So the 45 days is speaking of the judgments. 
of the Jews and the Gentiles that we read about this evening that follow the second advent of Christ. So there's a 75-day period. If you look at these two numbers, 1,290 days and 1,335 it's talking about, it, it, there's, 40, there's 75 days extra tacked on to after the, the, uh, the, the tribulation period ends. So you got 1,260 days, Christ comes down, stops it the second, with the second advent. Immediately following this, there's 30 days to reconsecrate the temple, build it, the, the millennial temple. Then they're going to have, there's judgments for 45 days of the Jews and the Gentiles during that 40 day, 45 day period. Now you might be saying, Boy, that's a lot, a lot of people. Well, you got to remember, the world's population is decimated. There's not, there's, how many people on the earth today? You look at the, the judgments and the bowl judgment, the seal judgments, and the trumpet judgments. How, many, how much of the world is gone? Some of those, you know, it tells us like what, over two-thirds of the world is gone. Population. So it's, it's uh, you know, it, it's, it's doable, uh, you know, in 45 days. So... Uh, this is what we have going on. And then he says in verse 13 to close it, but as for you, go your way to the end, then you, meaning the end of your life, Daniel, then you will enter into rest and rise again. So Daniel's got a promise of reassurance from God that he'll be raised from the dead. And he was an old man, and so he probably died not too long after this. So he says, you will enter into rest and rise again for your allotted portion at the end of the age. So again, at the end of the age, speaking you know, he gets a part of the millennial kingdom is what happened. He's, got, he's going to get rewards. He was faithful. So it's talking about you're going to get your allotted portion, means your inheritance. And Daniel will be given authority more than likely in the, in the millennial kingdom. He will give, he was, he'll be promised land, I'm sure, because the Jews were promised land. Uh, the church is a heavenly people. Um, so he is, this is, that's what it's talking about. This is re, Daniel's getting reassured by the Lord, hey, you did my will. And you're going to get rewarded for it. But you have to wait for a while. But notice when he dies, it says, he says, go your way to the end. Then he says, then you will enter into rest. So it's kind of telling us something when, you know, prior to getting our resurrection bodies at the rapture, it's basically a rest. Uh, you'll think that that's a rest because um, you and I are in, <laughs> going through trials and tribulations. We have these sin natures we're lugging around. We live in the devil's world. Uh, you know, we live in a world that's deceived by sin and Satan. And we're... The flesh is warring against the spirit, so when we die, it'll be a rest, and uh, it'll be. Uh, uh, you'll definitely understand why God calls it a rest. So, this is the end of the book, Daniel. And when we get back, uh, we'll get back into the book of Daniel Tuesday, Lord willing. Uh, if the plane don't go down, my uh, so uh, <laughs> say a prayer that doesn't go down. And if it does go down, say a prayer that I'll have the courage to stand up in the in the in the plane. And go, everybody, listen to me. <laughs> Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. What are you laughing about? Be, leave in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved right now. Maybe I could save the whole plane, go down in a blaze of glory. Wouldn't that be cool? No. <laughs> that would be cool. You get the whole plane saved. And you, and you, well, wouldn't that be, that'd be awesome? That would be so funny. Hopefully it doesn't happen. <laughs> Anyways, so uh, Tuesday, August 19th, Lord willing, we'll be back here to uh, finish, start the, uh, finishing off the book of Daniel. Uh, after the book of Daniel, remember, we got... Uh, after the book of Daniel, we're going to do 2 Timothy. But before we do 2 Timothy, there's, pro there's some subjects we're going to do. We're going to cover, and it will take like a month between books. I want to cover several different subjects. Probably do Doctrine of Inspiration, Canonicity, uh, History of the English Bible. I'm thinking of doing that. Doing a little bit. I was talking to my good friend uh, Tyler Thompson over here, uh, one of our scholars in here. And he is, uh, he, he was talking about textual criticism a little bit. So uh, we might do a little bit of a little thing on that. Um, and uh, just a little uh, a little uh, intro about about the subject because uh, it's a very vast subject. But so that's uh, what we're going to do when we get uh, finish the book of Daniel before we start Second Timothy. Well, we're going to have our uh, we'll cl let's close in prayer and then we'll have our prayer meeting. Father, we thank you for the study of Daniel twelve this evening. We pray there be a blessing to your people and an encouragement to your people. And our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, name we pray. Amen. Okay, we'll have our prayer meeting.